All right. Um, this is Jaron Abdallah, and I am here with Mr. Randall Branch, and we are at his um, counseling office in Murfreesboro. Mr. Branch, do I have your permission to record this interview? Yes, you do. All right. Thank you. Um, I thought maybe we could start with some of your family history. Is your family from this area, or? Uh, my family is from West Tennessee. Uh, my father taught agriculture in high school. Uh, my mother's father uh, had had a feed mill as well, not not a a, a grain mill. It was feed and seed, and uh, most of my family history has been in education and agriculture. And when did they come to, when did your family come to this area? I escaped from the cotton fields of West Tennessee after leaving high school. When I was in high school, school turned out to pick cotton. And, and that gave me extra incentive to get somewhere where cotton didn't grow. And so that uh, I came to Nashville immediately after high school to, to begin college. Can you explain a little more about school getting out to pick cotton? Because growing up in New York, I, that's just totally not something that I'm familiar with. Well, I'm 64 years old and you're... 26. 26. Uh, when I was in high school, it was during that period of time that uh, cotton harvest became mechanized. Uh, cotton picking machines. So before that time, it was done manually. Uh, and you either hired people to do it or you had family to do it and everyone was needed. So school turned out so kids could go out in the field and pick cotton when you know, whole families would be out there. If you had a three-year-old with you, you'd take a 50-pound uh, cotton flour sack and tie a sash around it and the kids would play in the field and pick a little bit of cotton. So when is that season? Uh, generally around uh, September, October. So you would start school? You'd start school, stay in school about a month, six weeks, and then turn out for cotton picking season, cotton harvest. And then go back? And then go back. Oh. Did you have a summer vacation? A little bit, yeah. That's so interesting to me. It's very different from anything that I experienced growing up. Uh, so you said you came to Nashville after high school? Yes. And what did you do in Nashville? Uh, I went to David Lipscomb, which was college at the time, uh, to study more pre-engineering curriculum. And then what did you do? Well, that didn't go very well. <laughs> I, I went from a, a, a small high school with a graduating class of about 24 uh, with an academic scholarship uh, to uh, a private college uh, of overachievers where I had to learn to study and compete uh, plus having the additional distraction of the big city. Uh, which didn't help my grade point average. So at, at the time there was also a draft, Vietnam War, and uh, I was drafted out of college. Didn't, didn't qualify for the exemption. And uh, I was, I had to go uh, fighting the Hawaiian Wars. <laughs> Essentially, I, I had to go to, I, I, I was assigned uh, a headquarters company in, in Hawaii, and I was there for a couple of years before I came back to go into college again. It, it took me quite a while to get through my undergraduate. So when you came back, did you go back to Lipscomb? I went back to Lipscomb for, for one semester, and after my army experience, uh, uh, the 
private college wasn't uh, what I could tolerate any longer. <laughs> so you were one semester at Lipscomb, and then where did you go from there? Um, I got a red Volkswagen bus and uh, hit the road, then just traveled around the country. To where? Let's see, I went to, uh, first I went to a, a friend's wedding in Florida, and then I went from there to uh, New Orleans for Mardi Gras, and uh, spent a couple of months there, just enjoying the city. Uh, I uh, would drive up and down the Mississippi River, pick up driftwood, and sell it in uh, uh, Jefferson Square at the market did charcoal rubbings of historical markers and sold those, just, just whatever to pay a little rent and a little food. That's so interesting. Just take, de decompress after the, after being in the army, mm -hmm. in search of America. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you end up back in Tennessee after being in all these different interesting places? Um, well, I still had friends in, in Nashville, uh, and uh, I couldn't uh, stay on unemployment forever. You did get, after, at that time, you did get unemployment after having been released from the Army, so I came back to Nashville. UT Nashville was where I next went to school and uh, got a job working in a frame shop, art gallery. Did that for a while. Uh, then uh, moved toward Rutherford County uh, and, and went to MTSU. Uh, and at that time I was drawn toward uh, alternative energies, solar energy, uh, passive solar construction. Uh, still pursuing uh, an undergraduate degree in uh, engineering. It, it was at that time, I think, that I hit uh, calculus. And uh, calculus encouraged me to change my major to psychology. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that. So you're still at MTSU and you switched your major to psychology? Yes. Okay. Uh, so when did you become involved with the mill? Um, a friend of mine uh, from Lipscomb had uh, married into this family of Wayne Epperly, uh was a realtor in Nashville, and he'd married into that family, and uh, his father-in-law was interested in buying the mill, needed someone to run it. I lived close by, so uh, I agreed to go run the mill. And you had some knowledge of mills from growing up? Just, just from growing up with my grandfather having a, a mill, uh, my father teaching agriculture, uh, Having a, a pre-engineering curriculum, uh, studied industrial studies at MTSU, uh, so I had I had some mechanical abilities and some uh, you know knowledge of agriculture. I, I also you know contracted with the local farmers to uh, grow the corn and wheat to, to be ground there. So had you, had you been to like Reedyville, Cannon County area before you started running the mill? I'd, I'd been to the mill before. Uh, I, I had been there when uh, the Kerrigans owned it. Um, but uh, I, I knew very little about the, 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 the turbine and how, you know, 
how the mechanics all ran. Mm -hmm. Well, if you would like to just take me through your experiences when you first started the mill, um, you know, I'd love to hear about that. At, at the time that I started, uh, there were there were some people at MTSU. Uh, I think Dr. Huda uh, was was brought in to gather information about the, the mill, a historical study, uh, document the equipment that was there. Uh, Mr. Epperly had got a grant to to, to restore the mill, so uh, the MTSU students came in to uh, kind of document the process. What was there already? What was there before? Uh, and and then how we were going to restore it, get it back working again. Um, one of the first things we did is uh, built a uh, a set of gates at the head of the mill race, uh, which was up by the mill pond. The way uh, the mill got its power was was from a, a turbine. It's my understanding that that turbine, undershot turbine, was brought from a gold mine in. Georgia, where I believe it was used as a pump previously. Uh, the East Fork of the Stones there um, makes about a half mile loop, uh, and uh, the mill race cuts across that, giving the, the turbine about a seven feet of, of head. Uh, and uh, the gates that we built at the, at the head of the mill race um, allowed us to close off the mill race, uh, service the turbine, um, control the, the water. And also there was an additional set of gates at the turbine that uh, allowed us to fill the, the mill stock with water. Uh, there was a, a, a series of smaller gates in the turbine itself. These were panels of steel about a foot square uh, that rotated and you could open and close those to regulate the amount of water that went through the turbine. One of those was broken and we had to have one of those cast, I think it was the James Leffel and Company that was the manufacturer of that turbine and they still had those parts or could still cast those parts so uh, we, we did that. Um, we got uh, a man named Adrian Gonsolin from Falls Mill uh, close to Winchester to come up and he stayed there. I lived on the property and he stayed with us there for several weeks off and on. Uh, he taught us to uh, uh, pour the lead bearings for the equipment shafts. Uh, showed me how to um, sharpen the stones um, and uh, how to clean the stones and how to make most of the products that we made there, the uh, cornmeal, whole wheat flour, uh, grits. Grits was the hardest thing to make because you had to separate it. I, I don't know how to make grits, so. <laughs> well, you, you grind the corn a little bit more coarse than you would for cornmeal and and then uh, with a series of sifters and blowers you uh, just sift out the uh, particles, small particles of corn that are, are called grits and the rest of it you use for cornmeal. Oh. 
Tom Brady still has got that process going again now. Mm -hmm. So you made cornmeal, whole wheat flour, grits. What else? That's that's about it. They're custom grinding. Sometimes people would uh, bring in their own wheat and corn to have it ground. Uh, some folks would bring it in for uh, livestock feed, and uh, sometimes folks would bring it in and uh, uh, have it ground into uh, mash for moonshine. That was one of my first uh, custom milling jobs, and he didn't tell me exactly what he wanted to use the rye and the corn for. Uh, he just stood there beside the the mill and I would adjust the, the stones and he would tell me if it was too fine or too coarse and and it was too coarse for corn meal and it was too fine for chicken feed. So I had a suspicion that it was for some other purpose I, I suspected moonshine. So after I got through doing my work and he asked how much I charged for that, uh, I said, well, just, you know, whenever you're finished with your process, if you can just bring me a sample of it, that'll be fine. <laughs> so uh, so uh, about a month later, he, he brought back a gallon jug and I put it under the uh, stairwell at the in, in the mill where I'd been told in years previous there was a, a, a jug kept there. Mm -hmm. So that, that carried on that tradition. Huh. Can you explain to me the process of making moonshine? Because I'm not really familiar with that. Well, I was trying to f find out more about that myself. <laughs> and, and, I, and I only worked there two years. And I, I had gotten the trust of the moonshiner to the point where uh, I'd been to his house, uh, but he hadn't taken me out to the woods to show me the still. I was hoping to learn that process, but uh, as, as I understand it, you, 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 you take the ground corn and, and rye and you put it in water and you let it soak and you add sugar and yeast and they're doing that legally in Cannon County now mm -hmm. and that that's recent and and the, the fellow that's running that Billy Kaufman now has, has hired several of the, the old-time moonshiners to turn over the recipes and, and work for him legally for the first time oh. I wonder if that takes some of the fun out of it I'm sure it does <laughs> you know, the, with this, the sense of the chase and mm -hmm. in my interview with uh, Joe Flipsy, he told me that really his customer base was moonshiners. Did you find that to be the case? No, uh, my customer base was, I guess, mostly the uh, the, the buying clubs. There were several buying clubs and uh, Sunshine Grocery in Nashville, a health food store. What's a buying club? Uh, a buying club is where uh, a group of consumers uh, get together and pool their food, food orders. And, uh, you know, 20 people may be able to get together and buy uh, 100 pounds of flour and, and get it at a a better price uh, than if you know each one went out and bought five pounds. Mm -hmm. And you said Sunshine Market. The Sunshine Health Food Store. Okay. And and we would uh, sell them fifty pound bags of flour that that they would sell to the public. What about from within the community? Did you have a lot of interaction with the community? A lot of people would stop by the the mill store and and buy small quantities of flour 
two pound, five pound bags. Uh, we had uh, honey that we bought and resold. We kept it in five gallon containers. I, I kept it in a, a it w and it was cold in the mill. We didn't have much heat there. Uh, and I kept it in a refrigerator with a, a light bulb inside it that kept the honey warm where you could pour it. And we had uh, sourwood honey and clover honey and and then we also had uh, orange blossom honey that we sometimes mixed with the moonshine and made what we called orange blossom special. Huh. There were craft items at the uh, the store. Uh, people would bring their eggs by there to have us sell the eggs for them. It got to be kind of a community center where folks would just stop and hang out. Can you tell me a little more about that? Like, and they just kind of gather there or? They would gather there, meet one another. Uh, during that time, there were a lot of people moving into Cannon County, uh, Short Mountain area uh, from places all over the, the country, people going back to the land and establishing small homesteads. And uh, uh, Reedyville was kind of between Short Mountain and Murfreesboro. A lot of these folks were still students too. So this was kind of a place to stop in between. So when you say, you know, back to the land type stuff, did you have a lot of, I guess, well, I'm thinking of like the, the farm in Summertown and do you have any interaction with groups like that or? I had interac uh, interaction with the folks from the farm at Summertown from the time they came to Tennessee. Um, I was in Nashville at the time and uh, introduced some of them to places where they could get uh, health care services. And uh, later on, I worked at a uh, work uh, with Vanderbilt University, uh, their Center for Health Services. And, and we established uh, farmers markets in in Nashville, direct producer to consumer sales. And I worked with the farm and them bringing their produce in to, to sell to the public. And uh, then my uh, first child was born at the farm. Oh. So uh, we, we were, uh, my wife was with me at some of these markets and uh, they, in, invited us just to come to the farm to for the delivery so i went and stayed there for a, a month and my youngest child was my oldest child was born there that's really interesting uh did you have any connections with them with the mill or like did they buy anything from the mill or no no uh, uh. Mr. Flipsy had mentioned that when they first came to Tennessee that they had kind of had some arrangements going on but that that didn't last very long. Um, so I was just wondering if you had... No, I, th I think that uh, yeah, when Mr. Flipsy had the mill that was when they first arrived in Tennessee and later on I think the farm was able to set up their own milling operations. Oh, okay. um, so what about maybe some of the uh, repairs and stuff that you did? I know you talked about the raceway and the gates and stuff. Um, were there any other major repairs that you had to do? Um, we did have to um, or tried to repair uh, a, a stream bank uh, on one side of the dam, uh, the this, this stream was trying to find its way around the dam and had on one side washed away part of the, the bank and uh, we, we moved a lot of rock in to try to stabilize that, but uh, it, didn't, it, it didn't work very well. It, it worked for the time that I, the two years that I was there, 1979, 1980. But uh, it didn't take long for it to wash that rock away and 
and now the, the dam doesn't work at all. It doesn't hold enough water back. So is that the same side now that's washed away that yes. you had tried to... Um, any other major repairs? That was that was the, the the major work. There was, you know, always uh, repairing belts and uh, grain chutes and elevators. And, and while you ran the mill, you lived on the property. Yeah, yeah. There was a like a double wide mm -hmm. uh, mobile home that was back behind the mill. Uh, a small septic system. We uh, built a, a, a public uh, bathroom there as well. What was it like living there? It just, it seems very secluded. Um, it's, it's not as secluded as being out in the middle of the woods. Mm -hmm. it, it, it is, Reedyville, it is a small community and, uh, you know, there's a, a, a where the, the mobile home was that, that I was living, uh, Russell's Market was uh, 50 feet in one direction and 100 yards in the other direction was uh, Tilford's Sawmill and Hardware Store. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, a quarter mile down the road was a the post office, so it, it was this small community. There were people around. Okay. Well, what can you tell me about the community? Um, what were some of the major, I guess, aspects of the community as far as like, um, I know you mentioned Russell's Market and the post office. Can you just describe what the community was like at the time? Small, <laughs> very small. Uh, you know, Russell's Market. Everybody knew everybody, uh, and if you went in for the first time, you would get yourself known there. Uh, the uh, the biggest business operation was Tilford's Sawmill and uh, Trucking Company and Hardware Store. That, that's where you see the most people. Was it difficult to um, kind of get established there? I'm just thinking about, um, you know, just in general when you move to a new place and especially when it's a small town like that, is it, was it hard for you to make connections in the community? It was fairly easy. Uh, I, I knew some people and those people knew everybody else. Uh, how did you get to know those people? People would stop in at the mill. Huh. They they wanted to know who was there and uh -huh. and you know what what we were up to and find out about us. Uh -huh. So I I didn't have to go out introducing myself to the community. The community came in and introduced themselves to me. Oh okay. Uh, I know that, or I was told that when the Kerrigans owned the mill, they had kind of like craft fairs and community events there. Did you do any of that or? No, we didn't do that. Okay. Were there any other stories that you can think of? I, I was just trying to think of the research that I had to do to try to do some of the repair works. Uh, specifically, I was thinking about the uh, the gates and uh, we uh, trying to think of the name of the individual that ran the mill before the Kerrigans. Uh, Mr. Flipsy? I mean bef before the Flipsies. Okay. Um, Justice? Yeah, Ray Justice came up one day and uh, I was asking him about how the gates were operated, the, the gates on the on the mill race, and uh, 
he agreed to go over there with me and I started to walk over there and he got in his car and I said are, are you, it's just across the street are you gonna drive your car over there he says hell yeah I'm gonna drive my car over there I'm too drunk to walk Wow. <laughs> I think Miller's were noted at the time for you know hitting that moonshine jug under the steps. Could be. Um, I was told that the mill was kind of the center of moonshine activity in Cannon County, which was kind of the center of moonshine making. Have you heard that? That the mill was really well known in the moonshine community? Well, I learned that, like I said, the uh. <laughs> first time somebody brought in, mm -hmm. you know, corn and rye for me to grind into mash. And, and, and yes, and then people did come, uh, you know, wanting to know, you know, you know where they could get moonshine. So how much of your business was moonshine related? Um, there was just that one individual okay. that, that that I got to know. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Well, so what you were talking about the research that you had to do for the repairs. Um, you want to share any of the history that you found out about the mill or about the various parts about it or at the at the base of the dam there's about a two foot square plug that you can pull out and uh, essentially drain the, the reservoir behind the, the the mill pond drain the mill pond and when we when we drained the mill pond i was able to find the remnants of um, i i guess it's a diversion ditch it, it looked like uh, about a four foot by four foot uh, wooden flume that that took I, I suppose they had to build the dam in the in the dry season so they were able to move all of the water through this area that would eventually become the plug or the drain for the mill well they built the dam around it and, and it was made of uh, wood driven into the ground it was some kind of wood that wouldn't rot because there was a good bit of it still remaining when we did that so what what would that have been for to channel the water from the river what little water there was in the dry season to this one area at the base of the dam so the, the water could keep running through while they built the dam okay around it so this is something that would have been built probably when they built the mill right prior prior to okay well actually the mill was was already there the original dam was downstream of the mill about 50 feet uh, and, and I'm not sure what kind of uh, overshot wheel or undershot wheel they had to run it but uh, when they increased uh, the size of the mill, rebuilt it, uh, they, they built the dam further upstream around the, the bend and, and got a higher head of water to, to do more work. And this was about Civil War era when the original mill burnt and then uh, they had to reconstruct? Right. Okay. So the building that stands now was built... 1860s, 1870s? That, sound, that sounds oh, about right. Okay. Um, any other 
interesting research about the mill that you came across? Um, there's an interesting set of notches in the doorway uh, with dates of floods and uh, there are times when w water was as high as four or five feet inside the, the mill. Did you experience any floods like that while you were running it? Uh, not while I was running it, but there was uh, a time uh, two years before I came there that, that there was a, a big flood event. It, there was at least four feet of water according to the notch. Uh -huh. hmm. Is that still there? Yes. Oh. As, as you face the mill, the doorway on the left, uh, it's, it's covered with paint, several layers, but if you look real closely, you can you can see the notch and you can read the dates. Uh -huh. Oh, I might have to check that out. Um, so you worked at the mill from 1979 to 1980? Right. Um, were you there when it closed? Yes. So can you maybe explain how how or why that happened? Um, why did it close? We weren't getting enough revenue from sales there locally. Uh, we weren't able to produce the quality of flour that uh, like Sunshine Grocery, for example, wanted. Um, I think that they run out of money that they'd gotten for the restoration. Uh, we didn't have enough money to pay staff to stay there all the time, and I was really working there just part time and in school part time. So it just, it just wasn't profitable to stay open. Mm -hmm. How many staff members? It was just myself and one other person. Okay. Um, and was Mr. Eberly's son-in-law involved in the operations? Uh, Kip Real, George Real was, was his name. And, and he would uh, come by and sometimes stay a day or two on the weekends. Uh, but most, for the most part, he stayed out of the day-to-day work and you mentioned the restoration when the grant that mm -hmm. the Eberly's had gotten can you what can you tell me about that like what kind of work did that entail well it it, it paid for building the um, the gates at the head of the uh, mill race um, we got Tilford's sawmill to saw the timbers for that. It, it paid uh, for the, the gates uh, at the mill stock. It paid for the repair for the turbine. It paid for uh, hiring Mr. Gonsolin to come in and help us with uh, sharpening the stones and re-pouring bearings and uh, fixing belts and Well, so it sounds like you did quite a bit of work on the mill. We, we stayed busy for uh -huh. a couple of years. Uh -huh. um, what was, I guess, the goal of that? The restoration? Just to keep the mill operating? Or was there like a historical aspect of that? Well, we wanted to keep it as close to being historically accurate as we could, but at the same time we, we had hoped to um, produce enough product, uh, have enough business to, to keep it financially viable. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, I've got some questions here, just kind of some topics 
that um, Park wanted to make sure. Um, but I think we've touched on most all of them. You said that you had visited the mill before you started working there. Mm -hmm. What, I guess, were your first thoughts about the mill and about what you would be doing? When I agreed to take the job. Mm -hmm. Um, I was aware of what needed to be done, and I knew that you know that the that the turbine uh, couldn't be uh, controlled with you know part of the one of the gates missing, uh, and uh, and that we really couldn't maintain the. Uh, the, the mill stock and mill race without the additional set of gates being rebuilt. Uh, I knew it was going to take a lot of work, but I, I felt up to it. I, I look forward to being out there. So your experience then at the mill, I mean, all, overall, do you think of that as a positive Oh, absolutely. I, I got I got to know a lot of people from uh, that from Cannon County. Uh, you know, uh, people that I still know today, and uh, and I'm still in in touch with uh, uh, Tom Brady, and still stop by there occasionally. So when you left the mill, or so the mill closed, did you continue to live there on the grounds? No, I, I bought a house in Murfreesboro. Okay. Uh, but you maintained your connections in Cannon County? Yes. Okay. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that, about, um, I guess through the years, what your connections have been? Did you have any part in the restoration? projects or when Tom bought it well I guess before then is what I'm thinking of when the community members um, you know putting the plastic up on the windows and did you have any knowledge of of any of those activities or even that the mill had kind of fallen into disrepair I, I knew that that park was trying to get the mill restored and, and I had gone out there at times and help put up plastic uh, and, and I went to the park meetings and uh, tried to act uh, as a, a go-between whenever possible with the Epperly family and the heirs uh, to do something to keep the mill at least stable mm -hmm. until permanent work could be done. Uh from what I read from previous interviews, there was some tension there between the community and the Epperleys. Is that true? I think there was some frustration in that uh, the Epperleys had run out of money, were not able to uh, continue with the work that uh, it they had abandoned, I, th I think the community felt that they had abandoned the, the mill and uh, I, I think that there was some difficulty with the Epperly family uh, given the amount of money that they had put into it and that, that they were reluctant to, to sell at a loss. Mm -hmm. Uh, which eventually they they did have to do, um, but b because of that, I guess impasse, uh, there was there were there was frustration on the part of the community that it was uh, the mill was going to be lost, and then there was nothing that they could do about it. That's an interesting point that you make about how much money the Epperleys did put into it. Because I don't think 
that perspective is often, um, I guess, put forward when talking about the mill and how it fell into disrepair. So I just, I think that was, that was a good point that I hadn't considered in the whole situation that they had put a lot of money and a lot of effort, obviously, into it. Um, and they may have paid too much money initially. Mm-hmm. Do you know how much they paid for it? I think it was seventy five thousand uh -huh. dollars. And they bought that from the Kerrigans. They bought it from the Kerrigans. The the Kerrigans had done a good job of uh, fixing up the store, the retail end of it, and bringing in things. Uh, they they were not as skillful as the flipsies were at uh, the mechanical end of things being able to uh, keep the equipment in running order and doing the repairs continue with that part of the restoration so the appearance on the outside when the Kerrigan's owned it was that everything was running smooth and good and it was viable um, and I think a lot of that just had to do with the, 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 the Kerrigan's ability to, to, to market and organize and sell. So was most of their focus then not necessarily on the milling? I think most of their focus was on the shop. Okay. Well, so what can you tell me then about, I guess, more in depth about your involvement with the preservation and with the park organization? And uh, I think that is such an interesting part of this whole story of the mill's history is um, the community's efforts to, uh, to save it however they could, given that they didn't own it. Uh, and then with Mr. Brady coming in, I, I think that's such an interesting part of the story. How did you first become involved with that? I just learned that the park had formed and was, was trying to do this work. When, when I left the mill, I was frustrated as well that, uh, that I didn't have, uh, or that monies were not available uh, to pay people to c continue the work. Um, I had just uh, graduated from MTSU uh, with a degree in, in well, uh, um, psychology at the time, but I'd also s started on undergrad, I mean, on a, a minor in industrial studies and uh, was considering a, a master's in industrial studies and had become more involved in alternative energies, solar energy. Uh, so I left the mill to go to Murfreesboro to start a solar energy business. And, and my next several years were involved in building and running that business. And so how did you hear about PARC? Um, I just got uh, a notice in the mail that, that there was a meeting. And had they sent that to you because of your previous connection? Or was it something they just had sent around Murfreesboro? Um, they, they sent it to me because, you know, I had, I had run the mill mm -hmm. before. And so uh, I came to the meeting and uh, brought a few mementos, things that I had had from the mill, little flower sacks, and well, what was the meeting like? Uh, it was more or less a brainstorming session. You know, what what can we do? Uh, you know, how can we get uh, the owners to uh, become involved themselves and at least keeping the mill stable. Mm -hmm. 
Did the Epperleys live in the area? No, they lived in Nashville. Okay. So what were some of the uh, the steps then that Park took to... I mean, I've heard various aspects of it from different people. So I know there was, you know, they put the plastic on the windows and stuff. And um, anything else that you can recall that they were doing? I, I wasn't that much involved with Park at the time. Okay. Fundraiser, I think they, well, they did some fundraisers to try and raise money to buy the mill, which then Mr. Brady bought. Mm -hmm. And you said you know him? Yes. So what's been your interaction with him? Um, I just stopped in one day, and I had heard that he had, he had bought it, so I stopped in and introduced myself, and uh, he had a few questions about some pieces of equipment and how things worked and uh, I would stop in about probably once a month and see how he was doing. So what kind of things was he curious about? Various pieces of equipment, uh, sifters, elevators, uh, the equipment that was used to, to make the grits and how it worked. Had he had any previous experience milling? I don't think so. Okay. Uh, so did you kind of then walk him through that process of how the mill had worked? Or where, I mean, where did he learn? I don't know. He's a quick learner. Uh-huh. And, and, and uh, endless energy. Uh-huh. Um. I think I may have done more to try to help him get the dam fixed, uh -huh. which was still an ongoing, I guess it's both an economic and a political process. Uh, we've had several meetings there with representatives from Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation, uh, Tennessee Wildlife Resources, uh, Department of Agriculture, you know, all of these uh, state legislators, um, all, all of these come into play when you try to uh, essentially rebuild a stream. Uh, there's uh, there, there's some case to be made for taking out all the dams and returning the streams to their uh, natural course and allowing fish to migrate. Uh, you know, there's uh, you know another case to be made of you know preserving history. Uh, you know, are there ways that you can have both? allowing fish migration and uh, species diversification and retain the mill, uh, the, the dam. Uh, the, the way it's left now with the river washing around one side of the dam, it's eating into uh, and eroding away uh, a field taking sediment downstream and degrading the stream. So there are people still discussing what to do about that mm -hmm. or, or can anything be done. Mm -hmm. Do you think it, anything can be done? I think anything can be done if you have enough time and money to do it. <laughs> That's probably true. <laughs> uh, so what would it take then to fix that given all the time and money that you needed what what would it uh, require a whole bunch of truckloads of uh, rock and concrete and dirt and uh, and then that would just be temporary uh -huh. I mean, rivers have mines of their own and uh, you put up a dam it'll find its way around it even 
the big ones. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to look at uh, Center Hill Dam and Wolf Creek, especially in this part of the country where there's such a system of karsk uh, underground caverns, sinkholes. Uh, the river will find its way around. It's, it's amazing that that dam has stayed there as long as it has. Yeah. Um, so if, if they could repair the dam, then would the mill as it is now be able to run off of the original equipment that's in there? Yes. Yes, the, turb the turbine is still intact. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, th there would have to be the, the mill gates would have to be rebuilt again. And, and that's what Tom would really like to do. Tom Brady would really like to have it again powered by water you know, rather than the electric motors that he's put in there to run the little stones. Right. So the way things stand now with um, the efforts to get the dam rebuilt, it, does it look like something that's likely to happen or likely to happen in the near future? Or? Um, it doesn't look like there's something that's going to happen in the near future. Uh -huh. uh, they're not it's not going to be economically viable to do it on a business standpoint to put you know, two million dollars into rebuilding a, a stream bank and uh, and rebuilding the gates and then expect to recover that revenue from either uh, sales of produce or tourism dollars. Uh, it, it might be economically viable from a state or county viewpoint to to rebuild it for tourism dollars that would come years later mm -hmm. and I don't know you can't put a dollar value on history right so do you think that's about what it would take is two million dollars to to fix it or was that just a number that you that's just a number that i just pulled out of an orifice uh -huh. <laughs> huh. that that would be really really neat if they could get the dam and the raceway set up so that um i'm sure it would, could... it would tickle tom brady's heart and 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 make the the members of park happy <laughs> to to see yeah. everything running like it did in the mm -hmm. early 1900s complete with a uh, hydroelectric plant and a jug under the stairwell and a jug under <laughs> except we could we could have legal moonshine under the stairwell now there's I, not there's not as much of a story to that <laughs> well there's a pretty good story behind that too well but once it's legal but that yeah that i think that is one of the most interesting aspects of the mill's history is the moonshine um so if you have any more stories about moonshine in the mill i'd love to hear them well everybody liked the moonshine even even the folks from up on short mountain that had their marijuana patches they they liked uh, they liked the moonshine too and sometimes they would come down with their crops and and want to trade <laughs> their crops for moonshine man that's such an interesting place that mill well it's an interesting part of the country please expound on that um, Short Mountain's a unique place, uh, both uh, you know the, the the community around it and uh, the counties that surround it. Uh, 
there, there are three watersheds that flow out of Charlotte Mountain. Uh, the Stones River watershed on one side, the Collins River, which eventually joins the Caney and the major part of the, the Caney all flow from the top of Charlotte Mountain. Uh, Charlotte Mountain's a, a geological outlier of the Cumberland Plateau. It has the same rock strata uh, and, and those three uh, watersheds that flow from it have, have washed the, the land surrounding it away just just leaving the, the, the mountain. It's, it's a rugged area uh, so for years the land was cheap uh, and that's what brought a lot of people in. Uh, uh, hippies of the day going back to the land carving out their little uh, homesteads uh, people starting um, intentional communities uh, small communes uh, the, the the sanctuary is one that's still working there uh, it uh, began with a few people uh, who were able to pool their money and and, and, and get a piece of land and it had eventually evolved into uh, um, a gay community that, uh, that still exists there. That's, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, if you want to talk more about that area, I don't have any working knowledge of that of just that area in general so I'd love to hear anything that you have to say about that so um, it's still I guess one of the closest really rural areas um, to Murfreesboro, Rutherford County. Uh, I, I almost feel myself pushed that way. Uh, in other words, I, I first came from rural West Tennessee to Nashville to go to college and and then found my way myself moving more toward Murfreesboro and and then more toward Readable and, and, and now is Rutherford County moves its way on out uh, and I, I find myself moving with it try, trying to stay a, a, ahead of the urbanization and uh, there, there are still small pockets of Cannon County where you uh, don't see your neighbor. So do you live in a more rural area? I live uh, currently five miles east of uh, Murfreesboro, east of MTSU, uh, toward Reedyville, okay. that, mm -hmm. that area. And, and I have lots, lots of friends that have property out there. And, and now, for the last two years, I, I was the president of Stones River Watershed Association and have been on the board for about seven years. And our current president lives in uh, Cannon County and is uh, uh, now president of the Chamber of Commerce there. He's, he's done a lot of work toward bringing in more entrepreneurs into the area. Uh, Billy Kaufman that started the Short Mountain Distillery. Uh, which is the legal Which is the legal moonshine, moonshine place. Okay. Neil, Neil has worked with Billy and helping him uh, find land and hmm. uh, if you want to talk about the Stones River Watershed Stones River Watershed Association yeah please I'd love to hear about um, that that started um, about 10 years ago as uh, the Black Fox Wetlands Association 
when a, a developer uh, was building a subdivision and s starting to encroach upon a, a historical spring and that area uh, was monies were collected and that property was purchased and preserved and after that was done it was then okay now what do we do with ourselves let's 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 preserve a greater area let's preserve the whole watershed so the Stones River Watershed Association was was formed and uh, the, the, the mission of the Stones River Watershed Association is to protect preserve enhance and restore the natural resources within the Stones River watershed and uh, we uh, provide water testing equipment to schools we provide uh, training for the teachers uh, for outdoor classrooms to bring the kids out to the streams to identify uh, wildlife uh, macroinvertebrates do testing for coliform bacteria pH uh, that sort of thing we uh, try to encourage the community to accept ownership of the river to become more familiar with the river so we do uh, canoeing kayaking events uh, we have uh, an event uh, next weekend that'll be the third annual Stones River Relay which is a, a four mile run from the top of Short Mountain to Short Mountain Elementary School uh, a nine and a half mile bike ride from Short Mountain Elementary School to the Art Center of Cannon County then a eight and a half mile paddle uh, from on the East Fork of the Stones River from the Art Center to Reedyville Mill and last year we started uh, what we call first Saturday paddles. So the first Saturday of every month we'll take another section of river beginning where we had just left off the previous month so the first Saturday in April would have been the Stones River Relay bringing us from the top of the mountain to Reval Mill. Uh, the first Saturday in May uh, we'll start at Reedyville Mill and go to Browns Mill. The first Saturday in June we'll go from Bounds Mill to Walter Hill. The first Saturday in July we'll go from Walter Hill to Mona. August from Mona to uh, Jefferson Springs. Uh, September from Jefferson Springs to Long Hunter State Park. October from Long Hunter State Park to Percy Priest Dam. And in November the final leg is going from Percy Priest Dam to the Cumberland. So throughout the season, the paddling season, we will have gone from the top of Short Mountain at the cusp of the watershed to its mouth where it empties into the Cumberland. And that's almost exactly 100 miles. Wow, that's really interesting. That sounds like a lot of fun. And it sounds like such a great way to get to know the area and the river um, that's really really neat and and it helps people to connect with the river that it's not uh, it doesn't belong to Cannon County and nor to Rutherford County nor to Davidson County nor to Murfreesboro or Woodbury but it, it's it's water that passes through all of these and, and all of us owe it to the river uh, to, to keep it clean and viable and huh. so how did you become interested in this I guess I first became interested in it when I was working at the mill and uh, my daughter that was three at the time that loves to be in the water and I have done canoeing and kayaking before that time as, as well and you know we'd like to go swimming in the mill pond and you know there's glass you know people go out there and leave their cola bottles and beer bottles and 
they, and and I didn't like that. I wanted I wanted to keep that away from it and keep the river clean. So I, I've always had that interest. Was the mill pond a big recreation area when you were there? Oh yeah, folks would come out and fish and swim and picnic and drink. <laughs> So that was just another, I guess, community gathering spot? Yeah, and that, that went back from the, the time that the dam was first built. Uh -huh. That's nice. Tennessee, I mean, it, it's landlocked, so it's nice that there are these places that have been created either, you know, naturally or, or man-made that, you know, you can go and enjoy the water. So, what kinds of, um, what other things, I guess, has the Stones River Watershed Association done? Well, a lot of times when we, we paddle, and sometimes it's, it's intentional that we paddle a stretch of river just for the purpose of cleaning it up. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll carry trash bags and fill them up and drag tires out of the water and, um, um, and, and some of the things that we do is, in, is trying to preserve stream banks, and we've done that at the mill as well, uh, where the river comes up close to the mill's foundations. There, there's areas of stream bank that, uh, where, where there's not sufficient vegetation or trees to hold the bank in place, we'll plant trees. Have you, through the Stones River Watershed Association, do they work with other organizations like PARC that are in the area or largely on their own? Or? Uh, we could fill up a t-shirt with <laughs> different groups. We, we work with the uh, Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation. We work with uh, Tennessee Wildlife Resources. Uh, we work with the uh, city of Murfreesboro uh, stormwater department, uh, our neighboring watersheds, uh, Harpeth River Watershed Association, uh, the uh, Cumberland River Compact, uh, City of Smyrna uh, Water Department, uh, school systems, uh, Children's Discovery Center, MTSU, uh, all kinds of groups. It really strikes me uh, in just thinking about this area, and uh, it really strikes me just the sense of community activism to preserve uh, resources like the river and you know, with the mill uh, through park, and it's really it's really nice to see those things happening and you know I think that can really be an example for other communities who might be interested in preserving different aspects of their history or their natural resources and it's not something that you would know about unless you came here and had a reason to ask questions about it so I, I really am enjoying hearing about that so there are organizations like this all over the country. Yeah. Uh, when when we set about to promote river activities, getting people out on the the water, uh, some of uh, my inspiration came from Pete Seeger, uh, who, upon seeing the damage that was done to the Hudson River. Uh, built a boat, uh, I forget the name of the boat, Clearwater, um, I think was the name of it, and, and it was a, a sailing sloop, and he built that with the intent of getting people on the boat and sailing them up and down the river so that they would see the condition that the river was in and and would thus be motivated to do something about it and so that's the same thing 
that we've done here and it's the same thing that people are doing on the the Harpeth River and uh, on the French Broad and uh, East Tennessee and the Hatchie River in West Tennessee. Um, last year I went to River Rally in uh, Charleston, South Carolina where groups from all over the nation came and uh, I met uh, a fellow there named Wansu M. His last name is M. I M. Uh, he's Korean and now we're working with him. He has a program called I M Rivers um, and he does uh, public participatory, what he calls public participatory GIS. And the way he's going to help us with that program here is you can take the, the I Am Rivers program, which is a computer program, uh, with apps for iPhones and Androids and if you're on the river and you see uh, pollution you see water water pollution flowing into the river or something being dumped there you can take a picture of that with this application and it will immediately go to our website uh, with the location and the date and the time and a picture and you can select uh, who needs to be notified to get it fixed then this this is something that's not not in place now but it is in place in other communities and and it's and it's coming into into place here so there's people all over the country doing this sort of thing wow that's neat that's that's really great um what do you think are the biggest needs right now with regards to preserving the watershed? Is it mostly just kind of human activity that, you know, with leaving your picnic stuff out or, I mean, what, I guess, you know, what are the biggest needs? Awareness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, education. Public awareness that, that what they do, what I do in my backyard, wherever my backyard is, that, that there's something downstream from that and that what I do affects other people and what people do upstream from me affects me. Uh, and, and the notion of, of taking sides that, uh, that we have to choose between uh, clean water and jobs that it's it's uh, that when we do something to preserve uh, an endangered species in the river that we're not making human sacrifice to do that in terms of loss of money loss of jobs uh, that, that eventually whatever makes the river more healthy is going to make the community more healthy, both both physically and economically. Mm -hmm. so the quality of life that, that that clean water brings to a community, brings people to the community, brings wealth to the community. So you serve on the board of this organization? I was president for the last two years, and I'm I'm currently returning as as a board member. Uh, my primary work that that I enjoy doing is is river activities, uh, canoeing and kayaking. Uh, the Watershed Association buying more uh, canoes, kayaks, introducing more people. To mm -hmm. river activities. Do you know much about the Duck River in Columbia? Uh, the Duck River is the most biodiverse. There's more biodiversity 
in the Duck River than there is in all of Europe. Huh. Wow. It's a, it's a long river. It's, it's relatively free flowing. It has lots of access. In other words, it's easy to find a place to put a boat in and, and get a boat out. Um, and, and there's a fairly active Duck River Watershed Association. Um, and, and one of our local attorneys, Frank Fly, was instrumental in preventing TVA from putting an additional dam on the duck. So how many dams are on this the East Fork of the Stones River? Because I'm, I've been told that at one point there were many, many mills in mm -hmm. the area. So are there a lot of existing dams? They're really more on the Middle Fork. Okay. Uh, the, the Stones River has East, West, and Middle Forks. Um, the, the only existing dams on the East Fork are beginning upstream. Uh, there's the dam in Woodbury at the water supply, uh, Woodbury water treatment plant. Uh, the next one downstream is uh, Reedyville Mill, which the river has washed around to one side. Um, the Browns Mill Dam has been uh, removed. There, there's just rubble there. Um, and then uh, Walter Hill, which is owned by the city of Murfreesboro. Mm. And then on the main stem is Percy Priest Dam. Mm -hmm. uh, on the West Fork, going upstream uh, from the lake is uh, Nicest Mill. That's on the West Fork. Uh, there's a small coffer dam at the uh, Murfreesboro Sewer Treatment Plant. And um, then there's uh, several on the Middle Fork. Uh, well, there, there's a small farm dam uh, close to Barfield Crescent Park. And then on the Middle Fork, there's a uh, farmer lake. Uh, also on the West Fork, there's, uh, in, in Murfreesboro, is uh, Ransom Mill Dam uh, and, and a bunch of, maybe half a dozen others mm -hmm. that were built for uh, just to have water for irrigation for farms and mm -hmm. livestock. Are a lot of them still in use? It depends on the definition of use. Uh -huh. none, none of them are running mills or producing power. Uh, many of them have been uh, breached or part of the dam is removed and the water can go through it. Um, I don't know that any are used for irrigation. Uh, you know, there, there's, there's several uh, residences that have you know put a pipe in the water to pull water out for irrigation of their lawns. Mm -hmm. There, there's been a, there are, are monies available from uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife to remove the dams, mm -hmm. uh, to bring back species diversification, uh, to prevent uh, the water from uh, Cooling, overheating, becoming stagnant, mm -hmm. and, and there there's several in Murfreesboro that that are under consideration for removal. Not 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 only for species diversification, but also for for recreational use. The dams are are, are hazardous uh, it, in high water when there's water coming over the dams. Uh, they they have uh, uh, hydraulics below the dams that trap people and people drown. Mm -hmm. So as far as the um, watershed, watershed Association, 
is concerned, would they like to see a lot of these dams removed then? For the most part, yes. The Harpeth River Watershed Association, for example, um, has been working for about three years to, to get a dam removed and it's the planning is all done and, and it will it will happen this this summer. Uh -huh. It is interesting. You know what hap what happens when you put in a dam on a river and then the river's natural attempts to get around that and then the issues of taking the dam out again. Um in one of my classes, we watched a documentary about the Klamath River, which is, I think, in like Oregon. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there was a Native American group that lived along the river and had used it for fishing, and um, it was really just a central aspect of their culture. And then with the series of dams that came in, just really destroyed that. Mm, prevented the salmon run. Yes, yes, exactly. And it's something that I personally have never given a lot of thought to. So, this is a really interesting conversation for me. So, um, yeah. Or you'll have to get your husband and come out and paddle with us sometime. Yeah, absolutely. We, we've got a trailer load of boats. All you have to do is just give me a call. Okay, yeah, we'll definitely do that. He'd probably be good at it. I don't know that I would so much. I can think of a couple of times in my life where I've been, you know, canoeing or um, things like that, and I just, I don't have a lot of arm strength. Is it something that beginners can just kind of come out and be a part of? Well, um, Yeah, you, if, it, it depends on the water level. Uh -huh. You know, if, if you get everything just right, the the right water flow that will carry you downstream uh, without having to do a lot of paddling, <laughs> but but not so much that you know it will you know wash you into the into the rocks and the uh -huh. strainers. Uh, uh -huh. You can you can do fine, uh, or you can you know, let your husband paddle in the front of the boat and you can paddle in the back or at least let, lead him to believe that you're yeah. back there paddling. <laughs> of course, those the two-place boats are sometimes called divorce boats. <laughs> so you might want to have your own individual canoe or kayak. Uh-huh. Huh. I grew up um, near a lake. And, you know, I spent a lot of time just kind of at the lake, you know, swimming, and uh, family members had boats that, you know, they would go out in, and, uh, but not really a lot of time on rivers, I guess. A lot of the Stones River, especially in the summertime, it's, it's, it's more like a, a series of lakes. Uh-huh. Uh, in the... In the lower reaches of the stones, it, it, they're, they're pools and shoals. You paddle a pool, and sometimes there's enough water to, that you can paddle over the shoal. Sometimes you have to get out and drag the boat over the shoal to the mm -hmm. next pool. But there's no rapids or anything, right? No <laughs> real rapids. It, it, it's, it's some water levels. There are two or three places that you might could consider a rapid. Uh -huh. There's one place by the uh, golf course. Here in town, where kids put in in their inner tubes and go about thirty feet through a few rocks, and they'll get out and go back to the top <laughs> again and mm -hmm. do that time after time. Yeah. Well, we'll definitely have to do that. That sounds like a really nice time. Um. It sounds like you got the Duck River in your front yard or backyard. Yeah. No, no, you're in. Or you're closer to the Elk River. No, the Duck River. I live in Columbia. Okay. Um, I've never been on the Duck River. But I just, I just did see that there's like a there's a rental company that you can rent boats and stuff to go out there or canoes and kayaks. 
is it for some reason I I'm thinking that whenever I mention the, the Duck River that people kind of imply that it's a dirty river that it's not a good place to to go um, recreating I guess is that is that a false assumption well it depends on your definition of dirty uh -huh. uh, the number one pollutant in almost all of our streams is uh, suspended solids and you can read into that dirt mm -hmm. and you know, that's this that's part of just uh, what happens when you have rivers and agriculture right. and development you know dirt gets washed into the river uh -huh. uh, dirty dirty in terms of you know, industrial pollutants, you know, poisons, uh, not so much. Oh, okay. There, there's, there is a lot of biodiversity in, in, the, in the duck. Uh -huh. uh, there was a National Geographic article about the duck not too long ago. Hmm. Well, that's good to know. Uh, well, I guess maybe if we want to bring it around back to the mill for a little bit um you know have you thought of any more stories or anything about your experiences there at the mill that you'd like to share um, there have been a few hoedowns there please <laughs> explain to me what a hoedown is well when uh mr epperly asked me to run the mill you know I, had to find other folks to help me with it and I knew a number of people at MTSU and you know one immediately uh, you know came up and said he he wanted to be a part of this and uh, I don't know much about the history of the parties at the mill uh, but before the time that that I took over there uh, but apparently there, there were a number of people in the community that liked to gather there, or bring their musical instruments, guitars, banjos, and um, so to celebrate the mill opening back up again, uh, word passed around, and uh, there there was a large, large gathering there. I don't know if it was a three kegger or a five kegger, uh, but but cars were parked along the highway all the way to the to the post office. Uh huh. So this was something that was planned, or people just kind of showed up, or it wasn't something that was formally planned. Uh, I think as as far as I knew. Uh, some friends came to me and said, uh, you know, do you mind if we, you know, bring uh, a few folks over and uh, and have a band and let the public know about it. Oh. And apparently these folks were good at planning <laughs> because it, it got it got real big real quick. Yeah. And that was before the internet. Uh huh. Yeah. So what happens at a hoedown? Well, there's just a lot of music and a good bit of drinking and a, a lot of dancing and, uh -huh. huh. and nobody got hurt. Well, that's good. And did those happen, you said just a few times or? Uh, there were a few smaller gatherings, uh, an impromptu wedding or two. Mm -hmm. I was just going to ask about weddings. I know now they've got it set up where there's a nice little gazebo and yeah, it's more organized yeah. now. <laughs> so more stru more structured. Yeah, so there were weddings there. Mm -hmm. Huh? Did you attend the weddings or did they ask I, I, permission? I, or? I attended one. Uh huh. And where did they have the ceremony and everything? Um, it was on the on the porch of the mill. Oh, okay. Why did they want to get married there? Do they have a connection to it, or just a connection to the the community uh -huh. around uh, MTSU, uh -huh. Readyville, Short Mountain? Mm -hmm. 
And this was while you ran the mill? That was while okay. I ran the mill. Did they have their reception there? or? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they pulled out tables and tablecloths and oh. got real fancy with it. Well, that's nice. Well, what else happened? Any other special events you can think of? Um, not right offhand. Okay. Any crazy experiences? It's not haunted, is it? Um, I have I haven't. <laughs> I haven't seen anything. It's not come up in any of the other interviews, but no. Um, I, I remember one time when we were building the gates to the um, mill stock. There were maybe six people uh, down in the mill race, and uh, there was a thunderstorm up around Short Mountain. And I had known from previous experience and just from people in the community that, that when it stormed up on Short Mountain that uh, you had like maybe an hour before you know, the water would be coming down the, the river. And, uh, and I, I warned them you know, that they had maybe 30 minutes before uh, they were going to need to get out of there, and uh, and in about thirty minutes they were still in there, and I saw the the first part of the water coming down the the mill race, and I said, you know, the, the time to get out is now. It, the water's here, and it wasn't five minutes. From, the time the first trickle came out until it was six feet deep. Wow. Did they get out? They got out. They lost a few tools. Uh-huh. Huh. <laughs> so the, the water comes up fast. Yeah. Um, yeah, anything else just about the community in general while you were there at the mill? Pretty small community. Mm -hmm. uh, Russell still has the store. Uh -huh. uh, he's got a little long, a little older, <laughs> and uh, uh, he's got another store. Well, the, the community has got really more isolated when John Bragg Highway was built. Now, John Bragg Highway was in place at the time that I ran the mill, but it's uh, it's more off the beaten path. It, 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 at one time, that highway uh, was the highway between uh, Memphis and Bristol. Mm -hmm. and there, was, there were tolls along that highway at one point, right? You're the historian. Okay, well, that's <laughs> that's what I've been told um, you've been you've been told that there were tolls yes there were tolls which i mean that would be a whole other interview wouldn't it tolls you know who ran the toll oh yeah i know i but i think this was a long time back not that's when roads were private yeah not in recent times but i was i was told that there was a toll gate in reedyville and it Maybe to cross the bridge. Yeah, when people had people had figured out how to cut through the mill somewhere and to, get around to, to get around the toll yeah. booth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then they just get back on the road and get to Murfreesboro. Um, you have done some digging, haven't you? Well, yeah, yeah, we did. We did some research before we started the project, and then course you just learn new things every time you talk to somebody and it's really been an enjoyable project so um, yeah we've got definitely we've got time left if you can think of any other stories um, any interactions you've had with previous owners of the mill um, 
anything you know more recent or current that's going on that you want to share so any of your involvement in that well, my most current involvement was uh, with Tom and, and helping him to uh, interface with uh, you know all the agencies that, that might come into play should we be able to uh, get the dam Mm-hmm. replaced. I think politically it's 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 possible to do it. Um, I, I think from a wildlife uh, diversification uh, aspect that it, it could be done in such a way that you could still have fish fish passage and along with the fish fish passage you know comes the movement of mussel species. Mm-hmm. And, um, and you've been there for breakfast. Been there for breakfast, and 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 the band. Uh huh. Um. What is it like there now with the breakfast? I've not been, so maybe you can describe what they've got going on. I I can't describe the taste of sausage. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> is it good? Or, or it's 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 great. Okay. Um, or, or uh, you know, the feeling of community. Uh-huh. It's, it's not like going to the Cracker Barrel. Uh-huh. Because there, you know, people know each other. Uh, you know, when I went to breakfast there, I, uh, I saw several people there that I knew. And uh-huh. I definitely plan to have breakfast there soon. I thought about when when I was there um, before we started the project we had a tour and um, I just had this idea in my mind that I wanted to buy a bag of grits which I didn't because I didn't have any cash on me at the time but I've never cooked grits I don't know I just the idea of buying a bag of grits to take home and cook but I've never cooked grits I didn't grow up eating grits well it's yeah, it's, it's uh, a local specialty. Yeah. I've recently ventured into the world of grits. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I, I enjoy it. I enjoy it. But uh, I don't know. I just, I wanted to buy a bag of grits. Just to say that you had. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I didn't have any you money can, on me at the time. <laughs> so you could write, write home to your relatives in New York uh-huh. and say... Okay, you know, I've I've got my citizenship papers. I've got <laughs> I've got my bag of grits. I'm a real southerner now. Yeah. Well, you're going to have to go get you some moonshine, too. Well, of course. Especially now that I don't have to worry about getting arrested. I think grand opening another weekend. Oh. They had a soft opening for friends and neighbors and it's still and it's currently open. Uh-huh. Um on weekends. What's it called? Uh, Short Mountain Distillery. Short Mountain Distillery. And whereabouts is this exactly in relation to Murfreesboro? Um, well, um, not sure you can get there from Murfreesboro. Oh, okay. You can get there from Woodbury. Okay. So you go from Murfreesboro on John Bragg Highway to Woodbury and, uh, you can keep keep going on the on Highway 70. That's the easiest way is to go through Woodbury. Um, about five miles, there'll be signs that say Short Mountain. I'm not sure it has a Short Mountain distillery, but you, if you just stay on that road, mm-hmm. it'll carry you right by the distillery. It has a sign on the highway. That sounds it's, like it would be a nice little. There's a, a, a little hill, say a little hill. There's Short Mountain, and then right next to Short Mountain is a place called Little Short Mountain. And it has about the same profile, it's just a little shorter. <laughs> and it's on Little Short Mountain, where is, is where the distillery okay. is. And it has its own spring where they have the water for the still. So do they talk about the history of moonshine in, in the area? Well, three of the local 
formerly illegal moonshiners are, are now under contract with Short Mountain Distillery and have brought their recipes and uh -huh. uh, they, they can, they can that, that stuff for a whole nother <laughs> That would be an interesting interview. History class. Yeah. Huh. Well, definitely. So could I have breakfast in the morning at the mill and then go for a tour at the distillery? Yep. That settles it. That's my Saturday. Uh, you, you, you don't need to go to the distillery with an empty stomach. That's right. That's. Do they give samples? Yes, they do give <laughs> samples. All that the law allows. Uh-huh. It's, it's a... Oddly enough, it's about the size of a little plastic communion cup. <laughs> huh. Well, I guess, yeah, I was thinking, I've been to the um, Jack Daniels distillery. Uh, but they can't give samples because it's a dry county, right? Well, Cannon County is a dry county, Is too. it? Oh. Really? I had not heard that. Um, for some reason, they're able to... And I think this. I think there's a state law that was changed. Uh huh. Um, um, Billy Kaufman runs the and owns the the distillery. Um, he he was he was able to get legislation passed in Cannon County to allow him to build the distillery. Uh -huh. And I, th I think that they're allowed both at uh, Jack Daniels Distillery and at the Short Mountain Distillery to sell it on the premises. Uh -huh. Yeah. S small quantities. Gotcha. Oh. Well, that's really interesting. I will definitely have to go visit there. Huh. Broaden your experiential base. Yes. Yes. I will be so much more qualified to discuss <laughs> moonshine with the next people that I interview. Uh, well, yeah, if there's anything else that you can think of that you can remember about your time at the mill, um, we have a little more time where, or if you think you've got nothing else right at the forefront of your brain, that's fine too. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this has been, it's been a really interesting conversation. I'm really glad that you could take the time to sit down with me today. Okay. So. Hope this makes the, the, adds a little more color to the picture. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, if you, if you can't think of anything else off the top of your head, I just want to make sure that before we turn the recorder off, uh, I had you sign the release form earlier, but I just want to make sure that on tape, I ask you, uh, do I have your permission to donate this uh, interview and the materials to the public domain? Yes. It's... Okay. Uh, and you will get copies of all of this. Uh, and one last chance. Any other good stories? Uh, none that wouldn't um, embarrass my children and maybe <laughs> great-grandchildren. Well, that, that is a consideration. Um, it's important consideration. So. <laughs> <laughs> we could we could talk in terms of you know your friends. <laughs> um, all right. Well, again, thank you so much. This has been really interesting. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>